Hey listeners, it's Alex, your host of EOA, Entrepreneurs of Asia. I'm a former operator turned angel investor based in Southeast Asia. This podcast is broadly exploring themes in entrepreneurship, startup, early stage investing, and more. For those who have been hanging on, know that I've been away for more than two quarters, taking a break from the podcast. It's been a combination of work and personal issues, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. If anyone's truly dying to know, you know hit me up and I'll consider elaborating the struggles in a separate episode. I haven't been totally away. I've still been producing a few episodes on the other podcast format I do, Low Level Barbarians. So if you're into more trending topics, uh, feel free to check it out. I still have been talking to a lot of founders across the Asia region this past few months, uh, looking for potential investments. I'm happy to say I have closed one recent deal, which I hopefully can share in the near future. As soon as the party gets launched and the founder is more comfortable talking about his new business venture. For today's episode will be a solo episode, which has an accompanying Substack that I wrote up. So if you want to see more of this type of content or want to support the podcast, uh, please help us subscribe. Today's topic came about after I was having a morning run last week, listening to an old This Week in Startups episode with, uh, back in 2019 with Jason Calacanis interviewing Marco Zappacosta. For those who don't know, Marco is one of the co-founders and CEO of Thumbtack. Thumbtack is a marketplace that connects professionals or pros of home care. Think plumbers, handyman, electricians, landscapers, and connecting them to homeowners in need of those professional services. Thumbtack is a gig economy story and part of the podcast, which I will link in the description below, covers some of those aspects of gig economy. But I do think that story is for another day. And also some of the details I write out lightly touches upon some marketplace theory. Also another possible separate episode if anyone's interested. However, what really struck me when listening to the podcast was when Marco was discussing his thoughts about pricing and how he has approached pricing for Thumbtack. And helped me really refine my own thoughts and adding new dimensions. And when thinking about pricing products or services, especially for early stage companies. And the main takeaways that I would really highlight were knowing the full value of your product or services, the value you actually end up delivering, and then being able to charge to that full extent. Founders are typically too wary to charge their customers. And the more important one, I think, is thinking, thinking of pricing in terms of value creating or value destroying. I guess there is a third dimension as well, which I didn't really explore in the article that I wrote was it's possible that a price setting a price or changing a price could have a neutral effect where there's no value creation or no value destruction. I would say that this type of framework or thinking is valuable. And I would put a caveat on it though, that you can take this framework and tweak your own framework, but the quality of the inputs that you put into it, the holistic view of your business and the related context are extremely important in deriving meaningful conclusions. In the podcast with Marco, I would say I wouldn't fully agree with his comparisons or conclusions, uh, which led to the pricing of Thumbtack. But that being said, of course, Marco has way more experience. He has a decade of doing this, uh, has far more traction than I ever had in any of my businesses. Uh, but my gut is telling me that, you know, there's more value to be captured that's being left on the table, at least. And how I've usually thought about pricing in the past was from two different ways, you know, like this kind of, and I don't know if this, like this, and I don't know if this kind of thinking makes sense, but to me it does. I'll try to explain it as best as I can. There's this type of bottom-up approach and top-down approach. And in this bottom-up approach, you would typically tend to try to set a higher price especially when you're starting out and you've just developed your MVP or you're even pre-product and you want to think about how you want to build out your product. I think a lot of founders don't really put enough time to think about how they should price. And once you set off on a certain price direction, it determines a lot of down chain effects that end up being very costly in terms of time and resources. And so more often than not, I end up typically advising a lot of entrepreneurs or in, in myself, when I look back at my experiences with the mistakes I've found most costly was that not thinking about pricing seriously. And maybe I should have started at a higher price, right? I should have set things at a, at a higher price that has enough margin, more margin than I probably thought I would probably need, and maybe even charge higher than that. 
And what happens is when you charge a price higher is that if you do get a paying customer, you can start talking to these paying customers and figure out exactly what they're paying for and why they're paying for such a high price. And you use that little kernel to, to start building upwards from building your product around, you know, developing your roadmap and your product around those pain points and the journey of that specific pain point of why they're using it and paying for such a high price. And that's usually a high quality signal because people are actually willing to pay you for that. Now, whether or not, whether or not you could pull it off and build a successful product and a smoother experience from that kernel in this bottom-up approach, of course, is to be determined as there's many other factors that go into that. The other way to find that kernel is to maybe think of a top-down approach where you set a low price and you, or you could set a free pro, or set your product pricing to be free. And what that does is it widens your user acquisition funnel and you get all types of users that come in. And you could take your time to sift through the data to kind of figure out which cohort of customers or what their what value that the customers are using the product that find valuable to build your product then from that kernel of truth. But of course, that comes with its own other problems too. Whereas the bottom approach, you know, you might have tunnel vision and you know, you're not sure if that leads to a bigger market. Of course, if you go wider. You could see more different types of customers and then see if it scales up to penetrate the bigger markets, right? I would argue though that a lot of the times for founders earlier in their journey and founders who are maybe younger or this is their first startup, they may typically, in my experience, may not have the business intelligence shops or the discipline or the ability to come up with a meaningful conclusion from a huge data set I don't want to say a huge data set from a large data set to know what they should actually be building and why, right? So when entrepreneurs or, you know, founders are early in their journey, if they're not sure, I might typically, I typically would suggest a bottom up approach because it gives you a higher, clear signal and allows for more focus. And with more focus you have, with the amount of constrained resources you have, it gets to be more productive, which maybe leads to higher chance of profitability and, you know, which leads to positive optionality. The top-down approach, of course, may find a better avenue towards success, but your ability to maybe navigate that with a probability of being successful to getting to your goals is probably lower, I would say, at least in my experience. And, you know, that's how I have previously thought about pricing products it's you know and if you're being very reductive it's you know set a high price or set a low price and then determine the strategy from there but in that exercise and what marco maybe really think about is when you are doing those exercises you know whether you choose to you know set a high price or a low price whether it's bottom up or top down or some combination of both layering in this layering in this aspect of, you know, looking at the price of it's whether value creating or value destroying relative to the user journey is a very powerful framework and helps you kind of guide those decisions much better with more clarity. Right. And, you know, if you think about what's happened in the past decade with, you know, huge amounts of money getting squeezed into VC as an asset class and, you know, and in turn getting uh, founders being able to raise huge amounts of money uh, insane valuations, you know, with this kind of macro context, we threw out this kind of wisdom of pricing, you know, blitz scale, build it big, figure it out later. And that's not to say that's wrong. It's not to say that's good or bad. You know, we don't make these kind of qualitative judgments. It's just a consequence of the game. So what's really important is to know your game that you're playing and that, you know, if you choose to do it in that kind of way, without doing the homework of knowing price at an early stage, it, if it's not a purposeful decision made from meaningful context, it leads to a current situation where we have a lot of companies that we're seeing today are IPO'd and maybe can never live up to those private valuations. Or, you know, it means that you struggle with doing the hard thing where you've set two of a low price. And then if you set a high price, you lose all of your user traction, which I've done that before. Uh, the perfect example would be when we were launching Easy Taxi in Hanoi. This is at, at the heydays of subsidies of rideshare in you know the early tens, 2013, 2014. Um, 
Hanoi market for rideshare was probably the fastest growing in the world out of something like 170 cities. And it was all subsidized, low price free. It was actually negative, right? Like we were burning money to acquire customers and we were getting something like 700 new users a day, which was insane uh, at the time. And without understanding the context of that and why that was happening, when you turned off the subsidies, 90% of the demand just evaporated. Ultimately, of course, this is a story for another day as well, but you know, that was because we, we weren't really solving an actual problem and pain point and subsidizing the market did get us to user acquisition top line growth, but pricing wasn't really well understood. And the pricing signal, if we had looked at carefully, we set a high price and it was buying is because the problems by and large already solved in the market. So that's just one anecdote. Um, so I, I think, you know, trying to put it together, historically, we lost that kind of discipline. I think that, you know, anyone who's managed to scale to the millions and billions of users uh, has been able to, you know, create a sustainable business in this kind of blitzscaling method with proven new economics would be the exception, not the norm. I would wager, you know, survivorship bias would agree with this. There are too many examples of what, you know, companies that we're seeing today that are having troubles because of a lack of price discipline. And having price discipline early on is usually a good idea when the risk is lowest, right? So when you put everything together, you know, whether approach you choose bottom up or top down, and you layer in this kind of idea of value creation or value destruction of price, and thinking about the second and third order effects of price, it should help you guide a lot of pricing decisions and make your strategies much more purposeful. Whether you choose to forgo a price, whether you choose to have a higher price or a low price, at least is rooted in some substance where, you know, if you need to pivot later on, it makes sense, or, you know, your roadmap starts to make more sense, your business planning starts to make more sense. And it doesn't hurt to do that early on. Whereas, you know, instead of completely ignoring it and having to figure it out later, and then you go backwards, usually ends up in very awkward positions, at least in, from what I've seen from my own experience and what we can see in the market today. Um, so that's, uh, I hope that ramble, you know, kind of made sense. I put it more concisely together in the Substack. So if you're interested, go check it out. And that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, I hope to see you guys back here for another episode in the future. Uh, EOA out. <laughs>